Welcome to the technological companion to the video lesson for a collection of probability density functions. In this technological companion, we'll rework many of the examples found in that video lesson, except we will use MATLAB and the TI-84 plus calculator in order to do the computations rather than working strictly from formulas. An automotive engineer has determined that the fuel economy for a prototype of a new truck can be modeled with a normally distributed random variable with a mean of 17.3 miles per gallon and a standard deviation of 2.7 miles per gallon. This accounts for variations in fuel economy that result from different driving conditions. When asked what the probability is that the fuel economy would fall between 15 and 16 miles per gallon at any particular moment, she responded by performing the following calculation, where we've used MATLAB's built-in norm CDF function, which is a part of the statistics and machine learning toolbox. And norm CDF accepts the value for the random variable, x, first, and then the mean and then the standard deviation. And so norm CDF of 16, 17.3, and 2.7 is calculating the probability that x is less than or equal to 16. That's more of a range than we want because we want the fuel economy to fall between 15 and 16. So I have to subtract off another norm CDF where x is equal to 15. So I'm throwing away the probability that x is 15 or below. So if I run that, we get a probability of 0.1179. In a similar example, we have a census worker who has learned that human life expectancy in his area of study is a normally distributed random variable with a mean of 81.35 years and a standard deviation of 11.64 years. This census worker wants to work out the probability that any given person in that region will live more than 90 years. So the range for the random variable in this scenario is x is greater than 90. It's a little bit of a different kind of range than what we saw in the previous example because it, it is representing an unbounded interval. So the upper bound that we would apply to our random variable is infinity. Well, we can tackle that problem a couple of ways, but they, they all involve still the use of norm CDF. And so what's going on here is that we are computing the probability that x is greater than 90 by plugging in a value of 90 into the random variable position of norm CDF together with the mean of 81.35 and the standard deviation of 11.64 but then we supply an optional argument of upper in quotes. And that says that we're going to calculate the probability that x is greater than 90, the upper range, rather than x is less than 90. And so if we run that, we get a probability of 0.2287. So that upper option can be useful when you're calculating upper ranges. We can also reproduce our calculations related to the fuel economy example and the census worker example with a TI-84 plus calculator. The calculator has a normal CDF function built into it. So in the case of the fuel economy example, we wanted to know the probability of observing that the fuel economy in a truck fell somewhere between 15 and 16 miles per gallon if we believed that the theoretical mean fuel economy for that truck should be 17.3 miles per gallon and the theoretical standard deviation should be 2.7 miles per gallon. We were also implicitly believing that the fuel economy is a normally distributed random variable. So the way we would do that is we would go to the distribution menu by clicking on second distribution and we'd select normal CDF. Now our normal CDF in the TI calculator allows us to specify both a lower and an upper limit for the random variable which is convenient for this kind of a range. Our lower limit is going to be 15, our upper limit is going to be 16. So we'll enter those in, 
our mean is the theoretical value of 17.3 miles and our standard deviation is 2.7 miles per gallon. So we enter that in and we reproduce the probability of 11.79%. Now we can also reproduce the census worker example. In this case, we were calculating the probability of finding a person who was going to live longer than 90 years if we believed the life expectancy was a normally distributed random variable with a mean value of 81.35 and a standard deviation of 11.64. So in this case, we would still go back and select the normal CDF function from the distribution menu. Our lower limit is going to be 90 because we want to find the probability that this person is going to live more than 90 years. And with the upper limit, the sky is the limit. Um, we'd like to be able to enter in infinity. There isn't a value of infinity available on the calculator, so we just have to put in a large number. And what I usually do is one <coughs> double E 99, which is the scientific notation for 10 to the 99. That's how we enter that in on the calculator. Our mean value is going to be 81.35 and our standard deviation is going to be 11.64. We paste that information in and execute that line of code on the calculator and we get our probability of 22.87. So as you can see, we can calculate the normal probabilities with either MATLAB or the TI-84 calculator. Where the normal distribution really shines is as a sampling distribution. In particular, we'll often see it used as a distribution to describe the variation in various types of sample means. And so we'll look at a couple of examples where we're using the normal distribution in that mode. The first involves a market researcher who is analyzing the results of an experiment in which the heights of random samples of 10 people were measured. Even though the researcher does not have a model for the distribution of height measurements, she has already estimated that the mean of this unknown distribution is mu equals 5.6934 and the standard deviation is sigma equals 0 0.7999. The researcher hopes to determine the probability of obtaining a sample of heights with a mean greater than six feet. Since her sample size is n equals 10, she invokes the central limit theorem and concludes that the variation in the sample means is described by a normal distribution with mu equal 5.6934, and sigma equals 0 0.79999 divided by the square root of 10, which is equal to 0 0.2530. Therefore, the probability that the mean of any given sample of height measurements is greater than 6 feet is going to be calculated once again with norm CDF, but we parameterize it by plugging in the lower limit of x equals 6 into the random variable position our theoretical mean of 5.6934 into the mean position, and our standard error value of the theoretical standard deviation by the root of the sample size, or 0 0.2530, into the standard deviation section. And since we are asking for the probability that the mean of a sample of size 10 is greater than 6 feet, we've got to supply the upper option. And so if we run that section, will get a probability of about 11.28%. Our next example also uses the normal distribution as a sampling distribution for describing the behavior of means of, of samples of measurements, except we're going to work directly with the, the, um, the data that, that comes from a sample that's been collected. A water quality technician is attempting to assess claims made by a property owner that they have addressed problems with their septic system and that nitrate levels down gradient from their septic system are now averaging at a value of mu equals 10. And so we'll create a variable 
in MATLAB called mu and store the value of 10 in it. And this, this is measured in units of parts per million. The technician then takes 20 independent nitrate measurements from a test well that's located down gradient of the septic system and finds that the following levels in parts per million are, are, are given for the, the nitrate concentrations. And so we're going to create an, a variable called D in MATLAB and store the array of these nitrate measurements given in parts per million into that, that variable. And we'll, we'll enter that in, in, in just a minute. Now since we're interested in the behavior of a sample mean, we're going to compute the mean of that sample using MATLAB's built-in mean function. We're going to store that in a variable called XB. And from earlier analysis, the technician knows that the standard deviation of nitrate measurements is sigma equals 2.3. That's just going to be a given. In some cases, we'd probably have to estimate that, and we'll, we'll look into how that would work in a future example. With this information, the landowners and the landowners claim that the down gradient concentrations are now supposed to be averaging at 10 parts per million. That's going to represent our theoretical mean, remember. The statistician computes a z-statistic for this sample. So that z-statistic is our sample mean, xb, minus the theoretical mean, mu, divided by the standard error of our sample, sigma over the square root of the length of the sample, number of data points, in other words. And I'm calculating that number of data points with MATLAB's built-in length function rather than hard coding it in as, as, as 20. And that, that just makes for a more robust code. I could reuse this another time simply by changing the data set. And even if the length of the data set changed, I'd still be calculating my z-statistic correctly. And so then the, the technician suspects that it's unlikely that the landowner's claim is true, but in order to quantify this, he's going to observe that the probability that z should be found at or above the value she calculated is she's going to find that it's small. And so what that means is that she's saying, what's the probability of getting a Z statistic at least as extreme as the Z statistic that's being computed right here? And so we'll do that by plugging the Z statistic into norm CDF in the random variable position. We're leaving off the mean and standard deviation entries or inputs because there's no need to when we're, we're calculating the normal distribution as applied to a Z statistic because we're working with the standard normal distribution now. And MATLAB is able to tell when that's, that's happening because we've not entered in values for theoretical mean and standard deviation. It takes those to be one. So norm CDF of Z with the optional argument of upper calculates the probability that we would get a value for a Z statistic from a typical sample that's at least as extreme as this one, given the assumption that the average, theoretical average uh, nitrate level is still at 10 parts per million. So let's see how this turns out. We'll run our section. So we see that we've entered in our theoretical mean, our data, we've got a result for our our um, sample mean turns out to be quite a bit higher than the theoretical mean. It's 12.5, almost 12.6. And then um, we've entered in our standard deviation and used that to calculate a Z statistic. So we got a Z statistic of just over 5. So what we're calculating down here is the normal CDF that Z is greater than or equal to this value, 5.0213. And we see that that's a very small value. Probability is 2.5665 times 10 to the negative 7. So that is a very small probability. So she does conclude that the landowner's claim is unlikely to be true. He probably, landowner probably really isn't observing average nitrate levels down gradient of the well clustering around 10 something. It's probably much higher than that. We first investigated how random sampling might work in conjunction with the normal distribution in the central lim limit theorem by looking at an example where a market researcher was analyzing the results of an experiment in which the heights of random samples of 10 people were measured. And they asked the question, 
if the theoretical mean of the population was assumed to be 5.6934 and the theoretical standard deviation was assumed to be 0 0.7999, what would be the probability of observing a height that is at least 6? And the way we would do that is we would go to the normal distribution, normal CDF once again. We'd say our lower limit is going to be 6. Our upper limit is some large number, 10 to the 99 is fine. Our theoretical mean should be 5.6934. And our theoretical, our, our standard deviation be, should be the, the standard error from our sample. So it's going to be the theoretical standard deviation of, of 0.7999 divided by the square root of our sample size, which was 10. And that's it. We should paste that and execute it and we would get our probability of 11.27%. In our second example involving using the normal distribution as a sampling distribution for describing the variation of a sample mean, we looked at a water quality technician who was attempting to assess claims made by a property owner that they had addressed problems within their septic system and that nitrate levels downgradient from their system were now averaging at a theoretical value of mu equals 10 parts per million. Well, in order to test that landowner's claim, the technician took 20 independent measurements of nitrate levels from a test well downgradient of the septic system. And if we were going to try to do this analysis, which we are on, on the TI calculator, our next step would be to enter those values into a list in the, in the built-in list editor in our calculator. I've done that off screen because there's 20 values and I didn't want to take the time to enter them all um, during the recording. So here they are. This is just the same data set that we saw in the MATLAB example. Now what that landowner does is computes a Z statistic for this data set. And it's a Z statistic based on the assumption that the theoretical mean that these measurements are supposed to be coming from is mu equals 10. And the theoretical standard deviation was just known to be uh, a value of sigma equals 2.3. So in order to compute the Z statistic, which is just the sample mean minus the theoretical mean divided by the standard error, which is just the theoretical standard deviation over the root of, root of n, root of the sample size, uh, we need to know the number of samples. We've got 20 of those. And we need to, or the sample size, we've got 20 data points in our sample. And we need to know the sample mean. The quickest way to get the sample mean is to simply go to stat calc and apply one variable stats to our list of data. And that gives us a whole bunch of descriptive statistics, including the sample mean of x bar equals 12.58242. So how do we use this? We need to compute a z statistic. So we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. We'll say that we'll, we'll just get our value and we'll, we'll calculate it on, on line here. So our Z statistic is going to be the sample mean, so X bar. So we're going to go to open up a parentheses, go to the variables menu, scroll down to statistics, and grab that sample mean minus our theoretical mean, which we've taken to be 10, divided by, open up some parentheses again, 2. 0.3, that's our value for sigma, divided by the square root of 10, square root of 20 rather, because 20 is our sample size. Close, oops, back up, I've almost made an error there. 
get out of 20 with the right arrow. Now close our parentheses. Right. That value is our Z statistic, 5.021275 and so on. Now I, what I want to do is calculate the probability of getting a Z statistic at or above that level. And I can do that by using that as the lower limit for a standard normal distribution set up with the normal CDF function on our calculator. The upper limit is going to be infinity. So the way I can do that is go to second distribution, normal CDF. Now my lower limit is that value that I've just computed, which is my current answer. So I'm just going to obtain that by clicking second answer. My upper limit is going to be infinity, so I'll keep the value of 10 to the 99 that's here now. My mean is going to be zero because I'm working with a standard normal distribution. My standard deviation is going to be one because again, standard normal distribution. So if I compute that probability, I get a value of 2.57 times 10 to the negative seven. And that's a quite a small number. So we uh, are corroborating the conclusion that the water quality um, technician came to in our MATLAB example that it's unlikely that the landowner's claim is true, that the average value of nitrate measurements are turning out to be about 10 right now. They're probably much higher than that. The chi-squared distribution is the next continuous distribution that we'll look at, and we'll explore it through this example. We'll imagine that a manufacturer of gold ingots desires to maintain a high degree of consistency in the mass of the ingots they produce. The mean weight of these ingots is taken to be mu equals 1,000 grams. So we create a variable called mu and store the value of 1,000 in it here in MATLAB. The plant manager is going to consider that the production consistency of gold ingots is out of tolerance if he has reason to believe that the true value of the standard deviation of ingot masses is more than sigma equals 0 0.001. So if we've got a standard deviation that's theoretical standard deviation that uh, seems to be higher than 0 0.001, that, that's going to be a problem. So we store a value of 0 0.001 in the variable sigma. Finally, in order to determine whether or not this is the case, the plant manager requires that an occasional sample of n equals 25 ingots so we set up a sample size variable of n and store the value of 25 in it. That sample is going to be randomly sampled so that their masses may be precisely measured. So let's imagine that we've done that. We've, we've collected 25 ingots at random, measured each of their masses, and then we go on and calculate the sample standard deviation, that descriptive statistic of, from the sample. Let's say it turns out to be s equals 0 0.0015. So we store that result in a variable called s in MATLAB. Now that's clearly bigger than sigma. But our question should be is, is it unexpectedly bigger for a sample of this size? Should we be concerned by it? And the way to make that comparison is to form the chi-squared statistic. The chi-squared statistic is basically a scaled ratio of sample standard deviations, or sample variances rather, to um, uh, theoretical variances. So it's equal to the sample size reduced by 1 times the sample variance divided by the theoretical population variance. In our case, that's going to be 25 times 0 0.0015 squared times 0 0.001 squared. And if we create a variable in MATLAB called chi2 and compute it from our already created variables of n, s, and sigma, then we'll get a value for our chi-squared test statistic. And the chi-squared distribution is the sampling distribution for that statistic. Now, we have a sample of size 25, n equals 25, and so that 
chi-squared distribution requires an input parameter of, uh, of new degrees of freedom in, in u. And that's equal to the sample size reduced by one. So I've created a variable called new, set it equal to n minus one degrees of freedom. And I ask myself, what's the probability of collecting a sample of masses, computing its sample standard deviation, and finding that that sample de standard deviation leads to a chi-squared test statistic that's at least as extreme, at least as large as the one that we found. Well, the chi-squared distribution does that. The CDF asks for our value of our chi-squared test statistic, the value of our number of degrees of freedom, which is hard-coded to be 24 here, but I'll, I'll make it new. And then I've supplied the upper option because I'm asking what's the probability of getting a value of chi-squared at least as large, because that corresponds to getting a sample variance at least as large as the one that we've had. So I want to know what that probability is. And I'll run my section to get that. I'll see that all of our inputs have been computed, and we get a probability here of 4.2624 times 10 to the negative 4. So that's really quite small, and what that tells us is that if we believe that our uh, theoretical standard deviation should be 0 0.001, then we should not expect to see a sample with a sample standard deviation with any greater likelihood than this, 4.2624 times 10 to the negative 4. So we shouldn't expect to see samples that are as variable as the one that we've collected very often at all. So the manager is going to conclude that this sample is indicative that production quality might be out of tolerance. He might want to investigate what's going on, perhaps by taking more samples or uh, simply just checking to see what's going on at the production line. Maybe maybe a machine is not working as well as it should be. We saw how the chi-squared distribution could be used as a sampling distribution that was related to a tool for comparing a sample variance to a theoretical variance or a sample standard deviation to a sample to a theoretical standard deviation. But it did this by computing another test statistic, the chi-squared statistic. And so in this example, we had a manufacturer of gold ingots who was trying to maintain consistency in the masses of ingots that they produced. And they were going to set the threshold of variability that they would allow to be a standard deviation of 0 0.001 in samples of size 25 of gold ingots whose masses were measured. And this was all based on the assumption that the target mass, the mean, uh, in other words, the theoretical mean of ingots should be a value of 1,000 grams. So what that, what that uh, manufacturer decided to do was to form a chi-squared test statistic after collecting a sample of ingots. So this person went out and created a random sample of 25 ingots, found the mass of each one, and then calculated the sample standard deviation of that sample of masses. And that turned out to have a value of 0.0015. Now remember the target standard deviation was 0.001, so this value is certainly higher. And the question is, is it high enough that this person should be concerned that their, their um, production line is, is working out of tolerance. So the way that this person determines this is they calculate a chi-squared test statistic of sample size minus one, so that's gonna be 24, times the sample standard deviation squared, or the sample variance if you prefer, so that's 0 0.0015 squared divided by 
the theoretical standard deviation squared, or if you prefer, the theoretical variance. That's 0 0.001 squared. So that is the value of the chi-squared test statistic, and it turns out to be 54 in this case. Now, we've got a sample size of 25 in this example, remember, so that means our number of degrees of freedom are just 24. So we can assess whether or not this chi-squared test statistic is too big, meaning that it's likely that the sample is out of tolerance, by plugging it into the chi-squared CDF, or the chi-squared distribution. We obtain that from the distribution menu, second distribution. It's down here towards the bottom, chi-squared CDF. Our lower value is the value of the chi-squared statistic that we just computed, 54. So I could either type in 54 or just obtain it from the answer variable since I've, that's the last thing that I've computed. Upper value is going to be 1 times 10 to the 99. Just a large value representing infinity. And DF is, is new, the number of degrees of freedom. That was 24. So we'll paste that value in. And we see that we get our probability of 4.2624 times 10 to the negative 4. So it's a small probability. It's indicative that it's unlikely we should expect to see a sample with this grade of variability in it if the production line is operating at a typical value of 0 0.001 for the standard deviation. So the production manager should probably investigate to see if something is going on with their manufacturing process. Our last example returns to a sampling distribution that's designed to model the variation in sample means. But it's not the normal distribution, it's student's t distribution. And this, in many cases, can be a very flexible distribution that we can use. In particular, it's valuable to us in situations where our sample sizes are small or we don't know the theoretical standard deviation of the population that we're sampling from, or both. And so in this example, an agricultural engineer is investigating the performance claims made by a chemical company that produces fertilizers. They state that under typical conditions, addition of their fertilizer to a one-acre plot of potatoes will result in an average yield of 32.8 thousand pounds. The engineer prepares five separate one-acre plots and applies the fertilizer to all of them. At the end of the growing season, these fields yield 29.28 thousand pounds, 28.84 thousand pounds, 28.86 thousand pounds, 28.47 thousand pounds, and 30.84 thousand pounds of potatoes, respectively. So we store those values in an array that get saved into a variable called D for our data set. Okay, next, the engineer is going to calculate some descriptive statistics on that data. They're going to calculate the mean and, oh, I've said variance here. Let's fix that. I'm calculating the standard deviation. So we're going to use the mean and standard deviation functions and apply them to our data set in order to calculate the sample mean and sample standard deviation. We're going to store those values in the variables xb and s. Next, she's going to compute the t statistic for this data as opposed to the z statistic but she's going to need to create a few input variables for that first. So we're going to calculate the number of degrees of freedom, which is just the length of our data set minus one, and, or the number of samples minus one, and the theoretical mean, which was the claimed value of 32.8 thousand pounds. So we've created a variable called mu that's going to contain 32.8, and nu that's going to contain a length of n minus one or a value of n minus 1. Finally, we use that information to create the t-statistic.
t equals the sample mean minus the theoretical mean divided by the standard error, which is just the sample standard deviation s over the root of the sample size, the root of the length of our data set. When she calculates this, it's going to turn out to be a negative quantity, and we could anticipate that um, if we looked at our data. We'll, we'll see what the mean of it turns out to be, but these are all numbers that are quite a bit smaller than 32.8, so we should expect that their mean is going to be smaller than 32.8. So that's going to mean, then, that the sample mean minus the theoretical mean of 32.8 is going to be negative and then divide that by the sample standard deviation over the root of the sample size, which is a positive number, it's still going to be negative. So we should anticipate our t-statistic is going to be negative, and that just reflects the reality that the sample mean is going to be below the proposed theoretical mean of 32.8 thousand pounds per acre. So she's going to plot the t-distribution calibrated with four degrees of freedom, nu equals four, representing the four that we would have calculated up here, understanding that you know, we had five data points in our sample. So n minus one, five minus one gives us four degrees of freedom. And we'll see where that value of our t statistic falls. So these two commands in MATLAB here are just creating a t variable to plot the t statistic with respect to over our wide range of values, negative 10 to 10. And we're going to see where the computed t-statistic from this input here falls on that graph once we run this code. And then finally, she's going to compute the probability of obtaining a sample with a t-statistic at least as extreme as the one she computed. Now this time, ex extreme means less than or equal to the t-statistic that we've computed here because that t-statistic, t is less than zero, um, it's a value that's less than zero, it's on the left side of the mean of the t distribution, left side of zero. So extreme means at or below that value of our t statistic. So we're just plugging that t statistic into the tcdf function with our, uh, with our four degrees of freedom. And that's going to calculate the probability of observing a t statistic at that value or below it. So let's look at the results. We'll run our section, go back up to the top for a minute. There's our data that's been entered into an array. We can see that our sample mean was 29.2580, so it indeed is smaller than 32.8. Sample standard deviation is just a little bit below 1, 0.9297. Four degrees of freedom. Theoretical mean of 32.8 was just entered. And then, in fact, our t statistic was a negative value, negative 8.5192. So when we graphed our t distribution with four degrees of freedom, this graph here, we can see that that value of negative 8.5, which is about right here, negative 8.5192 is well into the lower left tail of that t distribution. So we should anticipate that we're going to get a very small probability of observing a t statistic at that value or even further to the left because we're way to the left of where the bulk of the probability is. And in fact, that's what happens. The probability that we get by computing the uh, t distribution applied to that t statistic is 5.2079 times 10 to the negative 4. So it's quite small. Our agricultural engineer is concluding that it's unlikely that her fertilizer is performing as advertised, at least in her particular situation. We can reproduce our example of using the T distribution as a sampling distribution for describing the behavior of a sample mean where we looked at a agricultural engineer who was trying to determine if a potato fertilizer was performing as, as advertised. So the potato fertilizer was advertised to um, result in an average yield of 32.8 thousand pounds of potatoes per acre if they're grown under kind of standard growing conditions. 
in order to test that, the agricultural engineer went out and planted potatoes in five separate independent one acre plots and fertilized them using this fertilizer according to its instructions. And at the end of the growing season, she harvested the potatoes to obtain the following yields. And I've already entered these into a list in our calculator, but she found that she got 29.28 thousand pounds of potatoes from one field, 28.84 from another, 28.86 from the third, 28.47 from the fourth, and 30.84 thousand pounds of potatoes from the final fifth field. Now, those are all lower than 32.8 thousand pounds. So the question is, is, are they surprisingly lower? And she answers that by comparing the sample mean of this data set to the theoretical mean of 32.8 thousand pounds. So she needs to calculate the sample mean. But notice she doesn't have a very large sample here. There's only five data points in it. And she doesn't know the theoretical standard deviation of what to expect in terms of variability from potato yields, you know, according to the manufacturer. So she's got to she's got to work with the only standard deviation that's available to her, which is the sample standard deviation. And those two things, a small sample and the unknown standard deviation, mean she should probably work with the t-distribution. So she's going to compute a t-statistic from this, this data set. So in order to do that, she will need the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. To plug into the formula, t equals sample mean minus theoretical mean all over sample standard error, which is s divided by the square root of the sample size, square root of 5 in this case. So we'll go ahead and compute the sample mean and sample standard deviation first by going to stat, calc, one variable stat, and apply that to our data. We see that our sample mean is 29.258 and our sample standard deviation is 0.929688 and so on. So it's SX is what we're looking for. So I'm going to take those values and plug them into the t-statistic formula on the standard input line. So t is going to be equal to, open up some parentheses, go to the variables menu, go down to statistics so that I can pull in the sample mean minus the theoretical mean of 32.8. I'm going to divide that by, open parentheses, sample standard deviation. So I'll get that from my statistics menu, bar statistics menu, and it's S sub X is the sample standard deviation that I want, divided by the root of the sample size, which is 5 out of the square root, close the parentheses, and there's our t-statistic, negative 8.51915 and so on. All right, that's a very negative t-statistic, so that's reflective of the fact that our sample mean is smaller than our theoretical mean, and we want to use the t-distribution to assess whether that is surprisingly small. So I'll ask myself, what's the probability of getting a t-statistic that small or smaller when there are 5 minus 1 or 4 degrees of freedom? The nu is always equal to the sample size minus 1. So I need to go to the distribution menu to get tcdf. My lower limit is going to be negative infinity, so negative 1 times 10 to the 99. Upper limit is going to be the t statistic value that I just computed, and that's currently sitting in the answer variable, so I don't have to recall it. But if I needed to, it would be negative 8.5192. Degrees of freedom are 4. And I'm going to paste that in and execute it. And we get our probability, once again, of 5.2 times 10 to the negative 4. So it's a very small probability. We can conclude that it's unlikely that this sample of potatoes is performing in 
of compliance with what we'd expect of the average yield of 32.8 thousand pounds. They're all they're all coming in at surprisingly low yields. So she should investigate why that is. That brings us to the end of this technological companion. Thank you for watching. I hope you found it useful and that you'll join us for the next video lesson.